Chapter 37, Transportation Operations. As you know, today's ambulances are stocked with uh, pretty standard medical equipment, both ALS and BLS ambulances um, travel our streets. Um, we have state-of-the-art equipment and we can transmit uh, information directly to the hospital. It's kind of cool, the you know, Zoll monitors that we use at Central Kitsap. We can um, fax or, or transmit our EKG uh, when we do a 12 lead. Um, it's kind of cool, not that we're asking the doctors to interpret our uh, EKG for us, but uh, they can look at previous EKGs. They can, uh, it goes to the on-duty cardiologist. So if we have a patient who's having a heart attack, it, it, it just makes it much quicker for them to, to do a quicker diagnosis and get the patient seen appropriately. By definition, an emergency vehicle is any vehicle that is used for treating and transporting patients in need of emergency care to the hospital. This is governed by the NFPA standard 1917 and NFPA stands for National Fire Protection Association. And they are the uh, governing agency that um, sets out guidelines and standards for the fire service. And uh, they also um, have a lot of influence over um, standards for ambulance care and some of the private sector uh, EMS agencies also. <clears throat> Emergency vehicles come in many designs and you don't have to know all of them, um, but know the ambulance design that you are going to be working at and where the equipment is located. There are compartments and most ambulances, in fact, all of the ambulances I've worked in over my career, um, there's a driver compartment. Um, it can either be a van um, type ambulance um, uh, or a modular type ambulance, which has a box on the back. Um, and they come in uh, two types. They have a type one uh, modular ambulance, which is has a pickup truck front end, and then a van type two ambulance, and then a van type, uh, excuse me, a, a type three ambulance has a van front end with a modular box in the back. Um, and those are the, the basic typical ambulances that you have. They have equipment, supplies, radios, um, modern ambulances have computers um, and all of the equipment that you would need to help uh, transport a patient and save a life. At least two EMTs um, are on each ambulance. Um, they can have EMTs and paramedics, or they can have two paramedics, an EMT and a paramedic, and it, uh, staffing is completely up to the agency and uh, the level of care that they want to provide with that vehicle. After the um, modernization of the uh, ambulance in the 1960s and 70s, and after remember back in chapter one and two, we talked about the white paper um, this symbol, the Star of Life, was also uh, created about 1971, 72, I think. And it was um, designed to be a, the identifying mark for um, ambulances. And you'll see this on some ambulances. Um, um, initially, they were on all ambulances somewhere, um, but not all uh, ambulances are required to, to have the Star of Life on them anymore. Um, but if you ever have an inkling, you might climb on top of your ambulance. A lot of times a manufacturer will paint the Star of Life on the top. Here's the different phases. We'll take a closer look at each one of these uh, different phases. So the, the preparation phase, this is when we come to work in the morning, we check our stuff out, we make sure that we have all our band-aids and, and uh, bandaging materials, enough oxygen, splints, etc. And then if we find any discrepancies, we restock our vehicle so that it is quote unquote response ready at all times. Equipment is stored in various cabinets throughout the ambulance. Um, where it's located is completely dependent on where your agency decides to put stuff. Um, but they have slider doors on them. Sometimes they have drawers. Um, uh, some cabinet doors uh, actually flip up from the top or from the bottom and they have a hinge on them uh, with little 
struts on them so they stay open. We have medical equipment for the basic needs, airway ventilation, we can do CPR, uh, we have an AED, um, and wound care supplies. Also in your ambulances, you're gonna have other stuff like splinting and childbirth, the OB kit. And we talked about the AED already. We have equipment that we can move their patient. Uh, you hear, you see in the top um, illustration, the top picture there, um, that is a striker gurney. And then in the bottom, there's some uh, various jump kit or, you know, big, our kits uh, for, you know, that we take into the scene with us, much like the kits that you got to use in lab. Also during our preparation phase, we wanna make sure that we have our personal equipment. Um, do we have our PPE? Do we have the safety equipment that we're gonna use? Our safety glasses, our masks, our um, enough gloves. Um, do we have our stethoscope? Do we have our traffic safety vest, our, our uh, coats in case it gets cold? Um, and then do we have enough, uh, depending on whether you're using paper reports, do we have enough paper, uh, uh, report forms uh, for the day? Do we have um, uh, all of this stuff that we need to do our job, extrication equipment? Um, you know, do we have a map book uh, if we're not using a computer uh, aided dispatch uh, with uh, MCTs um, that has uh, GPS mapping programs on them? Can we find our way to where we need to go? And then, are we ready? Is there at least one EMT? So the law says that at least one EMT or higher level needs to be in the back of the uh, patient compartment during transport. That doesn't mean we can't have a first uh, an EMR emergency medical responder in the back, but they cannot be the primary care provider. It has to be an EMT. So every day at the start of your shift, we mentioned this already, there's uh, ambulance inspections. We look at stuff. We make sure it's all there. We check, uh, make sure it's clean. But we also have to check and make sure that the vehicle is in good running order too, right? So it's not just the stuff in the back. Part of the inspection is making sure we've got enough oil and water and it's got enough fuel in it. Um, the wipers are in good order. The emergency lights are working, the siren, etc. <clears throat> Is the oxygen tank properly secured? Does it have the right amount of oxygen uh, so that we can complete our, our shift? Um, most oxygen tanks, no matter how small or big they are, uh, hold a maximum of 2000 PSI, uh, pounds per square inch. And then um, we usually change them out when they get to about 500 PSI or so. So the calls come in in different, state, uh, different phases. Uh, we have the dispatch phase, uh, wherever your dispatch center is, whether it's a 911 center where a person, a, a victim or the victim's family, they call 911, um, they dispatch. The dispatcher gives us information. They should get information such as listed here. What's the nature of the call? Where's the location? Um, maybe they have the name of the patient. Mostly we wanna know the nature of the call and where they're at. Um, and any other pertinent information about uh, that that is important for our safety and also for um, taking care of the patient, you know, uh, information that's going to make it easier logistically to get to our patient, et cetera. Uh, and of course, how many patients there are. That's really important. Too. The en route phase uh, is anytime we're traveling on the road, that is uh, some of the most dangerous time for us. Depending on whether we respond in a conditioned red manner or conditioned green manner, and in Washington state, we only re, uh, recognize two conditions of response, um, but you might be working somewhere else, so, and they may have uh, different response codes. So in here, it's red or green. Um, just, you know, make sure you fasten your seatbelt. Um, lap and shoulder in the front, for sure. You know, when I started so many years ago, the back of the ambulance didn't even have seat belts. Um, we just had the bench seat. And now we have um, individual chairs, um, like an automobile seat almost, a lap and shoulder belt. And whenever possible, we are seat belted into that, that seat belt. 
sometimes it's not practical. Sometimes we have to get up, we have to move around, um, depending on the, the skills that we're performing in the back of the ambulance. But I dare say 90% of the time, we wear our seatbelts now in the back of the ambulance. So when we get on scene, um, the second most dangerous, although the slide doesn't say that, but I would say it's the second most dangerous time for us as EMTs. Um, remember, scene size up starts when we get the call. We start thinking about it on the way to the call. What are we going to? Where are we going? Are we going to a hospital and a bedside uh, pickup on, you know, the 47th floor of whatever hospital might be um, and transferring them to a care facility? Or are we going to a... a private residence, whatever it, it might be. What are some of the potential safety hazards? And I'm not talking about the um, the violent things that could cause safety hazards, you know, the, the dog, the cat. Um, sometimes those can be safety hazards, but what are the trip hazards in the yard? Are there toys, uh, you know, kids' toys in the yard? Are there uh, potholes uh, in the yard because the dog is digging holes or whatever it might be? Those are kind of the things. Uh, that we that uh, we need to look for as far as hazards, um, low hanging wires, you know, a myriad of things. So, and that starts as we're arriving on scene. Um, we start looking at the house. What kind of things do we see that that are going to be problematic? And then we want to think about ingress. How do we enter into the house? And then what is our egress? How do we get out of it? So, um, staging and and parking so that we can make that as comfortable as possible and Maybe we have to move vehicles so we can get uh, the stretcher in, and that kind of stuff. So uh, we also want to look for additional, uh, evaluate if we need additional uh, units. And remember, I told you early on, um, whenever possible, get another unit to respond with you. What's the MOI versus NOI? Um, is there a need for spinal mobilization? And then whatever else uh, drives our uh, taking care of the patient from there and follow your protocols. Do we have a mass casualty incident? And a mass casualty by definition is anything that exceeds the abilities of the responding units on scene initially to handle. Now, do we call a car crash that has four patients a mass casualty incident? No, typically we just call that a car crash. We, but by definition, that could be a level one MCI. A zero to 10 patients is a mass casualty. But we're talking like, you know, a school bus or a transit bus or something like that. Where do we park the vehicle? Try to be at least 100 feet before or after the scene. Um, so if we're approaching um, an address on the street, I like to put the tailboard, the back bumper of the ambulance, just past the driveway if possible. That way we're not blocking the driveway, but we have good ability to move in and out of the ambulance, um, and it's not cumbersome for us. It gives us enough room. And we'll see some illustrations here, like on crash scenes where we can park, and uh, just a few more slides. In fact, this one right here. So notice the fire engine is going to be parked on the traffic side, so the car crashes here. So if we're driving an ambulance, we want to come around in front of the scene. And we want to park in such a way so that we can protect where we're coming in and out of the ambulance whenever possible, as long as it doesn't cause too much difficulty. Usually we just pull in front, um, facing the same direction that traffic is flowing and uh, kind of angle just a little bit um, so that we're not, not as drastically as this illustration. And then uh, we always have the big truck, whether it's a fire engine or a ladder or rescue, some big vehicle that protects us from um, the traffic. It's harder to move the fire engine than it is to move the ambulance if it gets hit. So you don't want to think about that. Whenever possible, we want to park um, uphill or upwind of any smoke or hazardous material. We don't want uh, to be parked next to a car fire and fuel is running out of the car fire and we're downhill from it and now that fuel stream is running towards us and I actually was on a car scene a car crash scene years ago when I worked private ambulance where my partner parked right in the pathway um, as the fuel was coming down underneath the ambulance 
we were able to move it in time, but could have been could have been tragic. Leave your warning lights on. Um, if there's any traffic, um, let your local uh, protocol and how your agencies um, operate operational SOPs as to whether or not we leave them on scene when we're like in a neighborhood or something. Typically when we're in a neighborhood, I usually um, kind of depends on what the call is, honestly. Um, <clears throat> And then park in such a way that if we have to leave in a hurry, we're not blocked in, nor are we blocking anybody else in. So if we're going on an EMS call, for example, with you know EMT class, we go on a call and we need to rapidly transport that patient, we don't want to put ourselves in such a way that we're stuck. Now we have to back up a whole bunch of times and whatever. So think about that as we're arriving on scene, set ourselves up so that we can just load and go. Remember the emergency lights and the emergency devices are asking for permission to violate uh, traffic safety laws. Um, so whenever possible, we wanna make sure that we're on the same side that traffic is. Uh, we try not to face um, traffic. So if we are arriving on scene and we're in the, the scene is across the street from where we are across the center line, uh, we try not to face that, but sometimes that's you know, unavoidable. Uh, in that case, we definitely would always want to keep our emergency lights on anytime we're facing traffic. Then we have the transfer pay, uh, phase. This is where we uh, put the patient on a backboard or a scoop stretcher or a stretcher, an ambulance cot, and we get them into the ambulance. Uh, so you see here in this picture, uh, they're using the five-point harness system. They have the, the uh, straps over the legs mid leg and then waist and then it attaches to a shoulder strap to a harness that comes over the shoulders um, this is probably one of the safest ways to transport somebody a lot of times the shoulder strap for whatever reason gets uh, um, removed but um, whenever whenever possible we want to make sure that we can secure our patient as safely as they can be to this stretcher when we're transporting uh, we inform dispatch whatever information they want to know. For, uh, for our area here um, in Kitsap County, we use uh, CENCOM, our dispatch center. And for most of the agencies, we just tap a, computer, a button on the computer. It says we're going to either Bremerton or Silverdale. And beyond that, the hospital doesn't, or the dispatch doesn't even know we're transporting. When we are making trans, uh, we are um, contacting the hospital, the earlier we can let them know that we have multiple patients, the better. So we're transporting inbound with two patients. Patient number one is blah, 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 break. Are you ready for number two? And then we give the patient information for patient number two and so on. It is important that we uh, let dispatch know where we're going. For those of you who might be work private, I know some of you have already asked about that. Um, and you're working in the Seattle King County area, there's lots and lots and lots of hospitals. So it's important that you let your dispatch center know which hospital you're going to. Um, here in Kitsap County is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, there's only one. So it's just which campus. Um, and then uh, mileage is, is uh, considered a consumable um, and it's uh, billable. So we want to keep track of that. And if, um, you know, it's just, it just makes it, you know, then, and then everybody knows where the ambulance was also, how long it should take to get to a place, et cetera. <clears throat> so during the transport, we're still doing our um, patient assessment. This is where a lot of our secondary assessment is being done. Um, and then we do our reassessment uh, on, on the way to the hospital. And uh, during this uh, transport time, we are making our, our uh, report to the hospital, either on the phone or via the radio. I actually like to make my my report to the hospital whenever possible as I'm walking out of the house um, and the patient's being loaded that way because by then I have enough information I usually have a set of vital signs what we're gonna go what we're gonna do and I can give the, the hospital staff uh, plenty of time um, it kind of depends on where you're coming from how long your transport time is um, if you have time where you can sit in 
in the ambulance and talk to the you know, patient and then give the phone report and still have lots and lots of time before you get there. That's always good too. But uh, the hospital likes it. The earlier, the better. Uh, that way they have a an idea of how to assign the room when they arrive, when we arrive at the hospital. When we get to the hospital, we let our dispatch center know that we're at the hospital. We um, report uh, to however the intake is uh, at whatever hospital you go to. For example, if you go to Harborview Medical Center, you walk in the emergency room, uh, ambulance entrance doors, and there is a nurse uh, right inside the door. She is the triage nurse. She bans your patient. They scan the patient. Uh, patient's registration, they're registered at that point. Um, our quick, like, little zingo pow, and then um, they assign your room. If you were an ALS transfer unit, a medic unit, they announce that a medic unit is here and they kind of bypass that and they go into a more critical room. Um, so you need to know what, uh, what the procedure is at, at where you're going. Once you get to the bedside, transfer the patient onto their cot and then you give a more detailed, uh, complete verbal report of what you had uh, seen and witnessed and encountered uh, during your transport or during your time on scene and during your transport. Uh, then you clean your ambulance and you go uh, make your bed and you go back in service. So we return back to the station. While we're in the station, you know, uh, on our way, there's some things that we need to think about. Um, are we in service? Do we have enough equipment that we could run another call? If so, then we're back in service. If not, uh, maybe we got to tell our dispatch center that, you know what, we need to be out of service for a little bit because we got to decon and we got to restock. And, you know, you had a CPR call and you used a lot, used a lot of stuff or something. And then paper, paper, paper. Um, this is usually done uh, for me because everything is done on computer now. I usually write my, my report on the way back from the hospital. We used to have to write the report at the hospital and leave a copy of it. But with our um, computer reporting that we have in our system now, um, as soon as I hit save, it loads into their system at the hospital. So we don't have to leave a copy anymore because it's, like I said, it's all digital. So it, it's really nice. And it gets us back in service quicker. So we're serving our community better, right? <clears throat> Refuel when needed. Um, rule of thumb for most agencies, uh, both private and public, are um, your ambulance, your vehicle never gets below three quarters full. So if you're at, if you're banging at three quarter mark, you got to get fuel. It's just kind of rule of thumb. So we're going to clean. And I think we all know what cleaning is. And cleaning has taken on a whole new uh, definition, really. Um, as well as disinfection and then high level disinfection, all, all of this stuff on this slide. Uh, since the uh, coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease, um, we clean deeply after every call now. Uh, and probably should have been doing that for years. Um, but we, we make sure that we clean. So once a week, uh, typically you'll have like a, like a medic Monday or, you know, we weekly rig check Saturday or whatever day it might be, depending on where you work, where you go through and you count everything and you restock and you make sure everything's there and you do a really good, like super duper deep clean. Uh, and we still do that, only it's at a higher level now. So after the call, believe it or not, we have to, we have to strip the sheets. Um, and most of the time, like, we use the sheets for transfer onto the stretcher at the hospital, onto the hospital gurney. So we've stripped them already. Make sure we wipe them down, clean them. Uh, a lot of hospitals will have uh, some kind of uh, cleaner for us. And then we can just uh, keep it going right then. Then we can get uh, right back in service. Like clean it, wipe it down. Especially if we have any kind of uh, fluid leaking out of the person, we really, really want to make sure that it's clean. Uh, sweep and mop the floor. And then uh, then we're back in service. Um, and then we talked about this here. They create a schedule. And your agency will probably have a schedule of when, or depending on where you work, they might have somebody. I know AMR has 
uh, hires people just to do that. That's their job is to just uh, disinfect and decon the ambulance. Um, that's pretty cool. When we are driving the ambulance, as I mentioned on the post on the um, in route phase, uh, this is the most dangerous part. Um, is ambulances, and this is uh, a van type two ambulance, especially the van ambulances are very top heavy um, when you're driving. So you need to really drive uh, cautiously. So everyone who drives an emergency vehicle will have to go through some type of specialized uh, driver training, be it, uh, be it EVIP, EVOC. Um, EVIP is uh, Emergency Vehicle Incident Prevention Course, EVOC is Emergency Vehicle Operations Course, and then EVAP is Emergency Vehicle Accident Prevention. Um, some states require that uh, you have a special driver's license through the Department of Licensing, so it kind of depends on where you're where you're at. Um, you might have to get uh, uh, an endorsement to drive an emergency vehicle, uh, especially if you get emergency vehicles that have uh, air brakes or other uh, fancy stuff like the big trucks have. Um, and then you might have to get like a CDL, a commercial driver's license. Um, Washington does not because the EVIP courses that most agencies um, will have you take actually exceed the requirements for the uh, CDL. So that's kind of cool. You gotta be in good shape though. I mean, relatively speaking, um, you have to be physically fit. Um, more importantly, like, mentally prepared you know for driving an emergency vehicle it's not just here's the keys jump in and go really really fast you know i like the bullet point there emotional maturity and stability you know you we are responding to emergency calls no matter what the nature is no matter if it's a little kid who's choking on something or somebody who's having a cpr call we need to keep our emotional maturity we need to make sure that we are not driving with our emotions. Um, we don't do anybody any good if we can't get to the call. So, and when we turn the lights and siren on, we are asking for permission to break the rules. That doesn't mean that it's a, it's a pass and that if we cause a crash that um, it's no big deal. No, that means um, we are asking and we've essentially put a target on our back and our agency's back if something happens um, for uh, liability wise. So due regard. And I think I just alluded to this, speed, re, uh, speed does save lives or speed does not save lives, good care does. We are not going to save a whole lot of time by going really, really fast. Now, in some areas, we maybe it will help a little bit um, of high traffic and heaviness, uh, heavy traffic where we will be able to go through intersections uh, on the red, et cetera, like that. Um, but it's super important that we be careful and that we uh, drive defensively um, in the emergency uh, mode. Wear your seatbelts. Know how the vehicle accelerates in corners. Uh, as you're going around corners, um, particularly left corners, when you're turning left, and it works also on right, but think about squaring off the corner. A lot of people around the corner and start turning about the yellow line, and you know by the time they get to the intersection uh, into the lane, they've actually crossed over the yellow line. But we're driving emergency vehicles. Slow down, go through the corner, and square them off, and then turn. You should be clearly in the center of the lane when you make that left-hand turn. Big boxes, they tell us. Always know the local protocols. Uh, one of the things that can happen is um, you can get excitability uh, as a as an operator of an emergency vehicle with the siren. Um, um, 
some newer drivers will actually drive faster if we have the siren on. So uh, maybe using it sparingly is better. Uh, maybe just shutting all your emergency lights off and, and driving in a condition green matter uh, might be the best thing. But follow uh, your agency's uh, uh, standard operating procedures and uh, your local protocols. We have to learn to anticipate the public and what the motorists are going to do. The law clearly states, move to the right and stop. Everybody had to take a test to get a driver's license. And on most driver's license tests, that question is there. If an emergency vehicle is there behind you, what do you do? Pull over to the right and stop. It amazes me how many people just stop in the middle of the road or pull to the left or don't know where to go or you know pull to the right and then try to speed uh, um, and keep pace with us as we're passing them and all kinds of things. So if you come into heavy traffic rather than going faster through an intersection, actually slow down. Give yourself a cushion of safety. Anytime we're driving around when we're um, uh, returning from the hospital or going out for a detail or whatever it might be, if you cannot see the bottom of the wheels of the vehicle in front of you, you are too close, period. And, you know, under normal circumstances, we say that we follow from, you know, like a the three second rule, we should be at least three seconds behind the vehicle in front of us. So if they cross a line and we count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, that should be where we are before our, our vehicle crosses that same line. In an emergency vehicle, we should be six seconds. We should, you know, double that. Uh, give ourselves that cushion of safety. My biggest pet peeve with driving is tailgating. I do not like it when I'm with somebody who tailgates the vehicles in front of us. And by tailgating, I mean, if I can't drive a car in between the space between us and the car in front of us, we are tailgating that vehicle in front of us at the ambulance or the fire engine. And that just that just drives me crazy. Um, I don't like it in my personal vehicle either. And I really, really hate being tailgated, having people um, too close behind. So think about being nice drivers and know how to use your mirrors. And if there's a conflict, I like this, never get out in, of the ambulance and confront the driver. Don't yell at him. Don't scream at him. Uh, when I worked uh, for Olympic Ambulance, we had a guy who... Uh, Stuck his head out the window, uh, flashed some unprofessional uh, sign language at the individual. And uh, when he arrived back at the station, um, there was termination papers for him. So uh, it's really serious. Yeah, the guy got fired for it. So don't do it. <clears throat> we talked about this excessive speed. Um, remember, the faster you go, the um, it relatively slowly uh, is your reaction time. So, and our siren cycles um, only travel about 65 miles an hour. So we could put theoretically if we're on the, on the highway, could be outrunning our siren. So we got to think about that too. And we talked about siren syndrome. We don't want that. Uh, causes that. What is the size of our vehicle? How much does it weigh? When we're backing, we always use a backup person. If not, we get out, we do a circle of safety, we walk around, we look for hazards uh, if you're providing patient care. But when in doubt, have your partner poke their head out the window. Make sure you're doing you're, you're backing up safely. Most of the crashes occur when we're backing up. And um, this is the illustration I was talking about, uh, about your left, your left current. So. Follow the, not the apex early, but coming through nice. Actually, I would straighten it out even more than what the red line is showing. Nice, easy, uh, big box around that corner. So we all know that weather plays an impact on our driving. Um, some of the questions we had to answer when we took our driver's test. The same is true with emergency vehicles. Remember, they weigh more than your personal car. If you're driving a, you know, 
four ton emergency vehicle um let's let's just say a, a modular type three ambulance um weighs about fifteen thousand pounds well it doesn't weigh that much um yeah about about ten thousand pounds ten to fifteen thousand pounds um that's a lot different than you know your little kia soul or whatever you might be driving Know the laws uh, regarding use of emergency vehicles, when you can go faster than the speed limit, when you can't. What is your agency's uh, policy on this? Um, you know, like in Washington State, under uh, during the daytime, we are allowed to go 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. Um, at night, you're supposed to reduce that if it's, you know, but our agency is like 10 miles an hour. If it's raining, you know, or bad weather or dark and slow down and sometimes we just go the same we go the speed limit with our uh, our emergency lights on uh, we're just what we get is people moving out of our way which is which is kind of nice if we are responding uh, lights and sirens and we come across uh, upon a school bus with its paddle out we must stop, period. School bus takes priority. You cannot pass this, uh, let me rephrase, let me say that again. You cannot pass a school bus that has its warning lights and its stop paddle out, whether you're going per, uh, lights and sirens or not. That is illegal. You cannot do that, you must stop. There are also areas where you don't, um, uh, you, you would shut down. Um, so know those areas in your uh, communities. Um, we don't want to endanger people and property. Um, we don't want to make it worse. What is the right of way privileges? Yes, we can go uh, the wrong way down a one way street, but um, is it better for us to maybe go different direction? You know, so find out what your local pro uh, right, uh, stuff is. Um, one of the areas, some bridges, if they're long bridges like to Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, where people are not supposed to change lanes, um, you should shut down, uh, you know, turn your lights and sirens off if you're crossing the bridge. Um, small tunnels where people can't, you know, like two lane tunnels. Um, you know, it's a two lane, you know, it's just a two, uh, a one way each, you know, two lane, one, one lane each direction. You should shut, shut down when you go into the tunnel, um, and those kind of things. Use of escorts. Typically, um, not a, a big thing in most communities, but if you ever uh, respond to like some military installations, like when we go to Bangor, uh, we also, we always have an escort. Um, so we follow their, uh, their police um, to the scene and they escort us. And uh, um, mostly that's a security issue, but in some places um, it's, they, they're just a guide. Like it said, and I'm familiar, I'm familiar with terror trucks. I don't know much about where to go on Bangor, so it's good they've come with us. Intersections are dangerous. Um, we all know that. And that's where most crashes happen in, uh, you know, between two vehicles is in an intersection. Um, so when you're coming to an intersection and it is uncontrolled, as in it does not have traffic lights, it just has a stop sign, or it doesn't have controlled intersections, uh, in other words, traffic lights that we can take control of with our Opticom light, or, you know, you must stop. Maintain, you know, make sure that you have control of the intersection and then proceed. So no, we don't get to run stop lights or stop signs when we're running with lights and sirens. We still have to stop. <clears throat> Uh, the top one there, um, highways shut down, emergency lights until that's the agency and um, kind of your area specific. Um, some places that makes sense. Uh, if you uh, have ever seen Tacoma Fire uh, respond when they get on uh, I-5, they shut down uh, as they, they, they'll run priority to the ramp. Once they get on the highway, everybody moves over to the far left lane and they stay in that um, shut down 
mode until they come upon their car crash or whatever it might be, or until they are going to get uh, off. Um, unless, you know, depending on, on what they're responding to. Um, but if they're responding to a motor vehicle collision on the highway, they also bring, um, you always get a, an ambulance, a fire engine, a ladder truck, a battalion chief. Um, and the ladder truck's job is to, uh, that's the big traffic stop. So anyway, um, what are some of the other distractions that we can see while we're driving? Well, there's you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, we, in our vehicles, and we're talking about our distractions. We have computer terminals that we're looking at. We're trying to look at the G GPS map, um, the stereo, you know. So my rule of thumb is I want to hear my my dispatch radio over this over the uh, AM FM radio. Um, so it's cool that it's there, uh, but that's not what I'm there for. And you know, you'll have guys who blare it, whatever. And especially, I don't want to hear it when I have a patient in the back. Um, cell phones, we're not, even though uh, in Washington State, for example, emergency vehicles ha are exempt uh, from driving and talking on the cell phone. Um, we have an agency policy where I work that says, unless you're the battalion, um, somebody else talks on the phone, not the driver, even if they need to talk to the driver. So it's nice that we have two people typically in our vehicles, so somebody can be watching the, the radios and uh, looking at the computer terminals and that kind of stuff. And then eating and drinking does happen. I mean, you're going to go back and forth, and um, especially when you're working private, you're going to be living in that ambulance. Um, so think about those things as being a part of the distraction. We've seen people driving down the road, uh, eating and you know just making a mess um, and drive, weaving all over the road. Uh, how unprofessional would that be if that's us in the ambulance? Rarely do we drive alone, but we drive uh, relatively alone um, when we're We have our patient in the back and we're up front. So now we're responsible to keep track of all of this stuff, uh, make sure that we can, uh, that, we're, that we're prepared, we're rested. You know, so when we come to work, what did we do before we got there uh, the day before? Um, are we able to to be mentally clear? And then, uh, as I mentioned, you know, what is our what is our fatigue level like? Do we need to rest? Hopefully, we can, but we can't always guarantee that that's going to happen. So, <clears throat> some agencies will use air medical operations. Know your local protocols. What types of vehicles, uh, aircraft you're going to use, uh, whether it's a a rotary wing aircraft like a helicopter like airlift northwest although airlift also has a fixed wing um, aircraft so know when and where and uh, where the landing zones are that, that you may be going to um, and i'm just going to kind of go through this really quick because we need to know when um, we're going to call and is it is it the EMT's job or the paramedic's job or is it the lieutenant's job or the captain or whoever it might be to call the helicopter? That's all agency specific. If you arrive on scene as a BLS provider and you're like, wow, this person's going to need a trauma center and they need to be air, airlifted, then contact and put them on standby or whatever your protocols are. Know the capabilities of uh, the uh, the helicopter that's coming in, what they can do, what they can't do. Is the patient too big for the aircraft or they or or not? You know, those are very important questions. What is the weather like? It might be really nice where you are, but it might not be um, so nice where the uh, air, aircraft is coming from and they might not be able to fly. So have a have a back. Um, sometimes we do. Uh, uh, airlift at the scene, usually it's at a, land, uh, a designated landing zone. So know how to set that up, um, what type of patients are going to be transported. Uh, most commonly in our area, it's severe trauma and burn patients that are being transported via um, air medical transport. Who can call? It, it kind of depends. Um, here we 
we notify dispatch, CENCOM, and they make the phone call. And we have a choice. Um, we, so they just call and whoever can has the shortest ETA between airlift or um, um, lifeline. If you don't have um, a designated landing zone, again, follow your local protocol, but it needs to be big enough um, and free of stuff and, and wires and uh, whatever. When you're setting up a landing zone, this is really important to, to point at the bottom. Don't use flares. Um, don't use anything bright white um, that can distract the, the pilot, especially at night, and you don't want to mess up their vision, especially if they're flying with night vision. Uh, that could really be uh, dangerous. Always approach the aircraft from the front or the side. Uh, make, uh, make sure that you have eye contact with the pilot. Uh, never come from the back of the aircraft uh, unless it is completely and sh totally shut down and only if the pilot tells you it's okay. Um, some of the aircraft will have uh, the load from the rear. Um, and so you kind of have to approach from the rear a little bit. Um, and I've uh, used both, uh, I've transported patients onto both of those uh, types of uh, aircraft. So, and we talked about that. Make certain that all equipment of the patient is secured to the stretcher. And um, I always wear air protection, I actually wear my helmet uh, when I'm on a, a helicopter uh, transfer also, because um, I don't like banging my head on stuff. So not that I have to do that. If uh, you have enough people and they've been trained in this, you can use these uh, whiz -bang cool uh, hand signals. Most of the pilots in our area when are, who are flying to designated landing zones like at Harrison or like uh, on Bainbridge Island, Station 21, um, uh, South Kitsap, I'm not sure where they have some of their landing zones. Um, like we used to use the Kitsap Mall parking lot was a designated landing zone. The pilots know the coordinates. They know where they're going. Uh, they'll do a circle of safety as they come in and then uh, they'll land. We talked about this night, land, uh, night landing. Uh, low intensity lights are huge. Uh, use that. Um, if there's any hazards, please let them know. Uh, wires, branches, whatever it might be. And that's the nice thing again about going to a, a designated landing zone that already has lights set up, uh, landing lights and, and, and such, like at uh, Station 21, for example, or at uh, uh, Harrison Silverdale. Um, or Bremerton, where they have the helipad on the roof. Um, those are already um, FAA approved landing zones. So it's easy peasy for the pilot. Always approach from the downhill side. Stay away from the big rotators. Um, I have done two what we call hot loads in my career, where the uh, rotors, uh, the uh, rotor wings are still spinning. Um, a scariest thing I think I've ever done because um, it's just like, and I'm short, you know, there's no way that's going to hit me, but I'm, you just worry about it it's like crazy. Um, Joe used to be a flight medic uh, when he was in Spokane and um, he, has a, he has a lot more experience with aircraft than I do. <laughs> Medivacs can be hazardous. So what's the risk benefit analysis? of flying somebody um, if it's decent weather and it's really going to make a difference in the outcome of the patient then you know use your best judgment if it's not so good weather it's raining really bad um, it's blowing it's windy maybe air medical might not be uh, the best thing the worst thing you know losing a helicopter and all souls on board is probably one of the worst things that could happen. And it has happened. Um, in airlift's history, fortunately, it's only happened two times. But still, it's pretty, that's too, too many. So. Um, I don't know much about the helicopters that they use or the requirements that the pilots have uh, gone through. Um, I do know that they're very small and they can't do a whole lot of, um, they can do CPR uh, and airlift, uh, for example, um, but they use like Lucas device. Um, 
and even before that they could do it but it's it's very limited space that's really hard so uh, they cruise 130 to 150 miles an hour um, they go about 10,000 feet above sea level that's that's pretty good um, but there are some issues so that's uh, uh, emergency transportation uh, I hope that uh, that was uh, helpful